I'm Peter Marty, host of Grace Matters, the radio ministry of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and this edition of Mosaic. In this introduction to Jesus of Nazareth, we'll take you to historic and important sites mentioned in the Gospel accounts, from the town where it all began, Nazareth, to other places like Bethlehem, Jerusalem, and the Sea of Galilee. The story of Jesus of Nazareth is told in the books and the letters of the New Testament. In this video, you will hear the story of Jesus based on accounts recorded in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark was the first one to be written, followed by, I believe, Matthew, and then Luke, and John was the last one to be written uh, somewhere around the year 100 AD. But there are four different stories told from four different viewpoints by four different authors, writers, people who had heard and listened to the story being told them by others. They're all the same story, you know, basically. You can't do too much wiggling with, with, the, with the details in there, but they're told from different perspectives, um, depending on whom they were writing for. Jesus was born right around the start of the first century. Since Old Testament times, Palestine has been controlled by a succession of foreign powers, the Persians, the Greeks, and later the Romans. Many Jews living in first century Palestine dreamed of the day when a prophesied Messiah would rally the people and drive the hated Romans out of the Holy Land. Jesus' mother Mary was engaged to a carpenter named Joseph. They lived here in Nazareth in the Galilee region, several days journey north of Jerusalem. The Bible tells us that young Mary was a virgin. She learned of her pregnancy in an event Christians refer to as the Annunciation. The angel came to Mary and announced to her that she had been chosen to be the mother of Jesus Christ. The angel comes and says, don't be afraid. I bring you good news. And the good news is that she's going to have a son, and her son will be the Son of God. And she was just a young virgin, maybe 15 or 16 years of age. And imagine being a teenager and having an angel come to you and say this powerful message that you're going to conceive from the Holy Spirit. And she simply said, here I am. God gave Mary the strength to carry a child in a day and age where you just didn't do that when you weren't married yet. And God gave her the strength to do that and to be the mother of Christ. And she did, and we're forever grateful for her service. It cost money to run the Roman Empire, and Rome's subjects paid the price. To exact as much as he could from them, Caesar Augustus developed a system of taxation based on a census of the population of each province. Joseph and the now pregnant Mary returned here to Bethlehem, Joseph's ancestral home, to be counted in the census. This is the church of the Nativity built on the site where tradition holds that Jesus was born. Luke's Gospel tells us that after giving birth, Mary laid Jesus in a manger or a feeding trough for animals because there was no room for them in the inn. The nativity scene to me gives a message that Jesus was born in a humble estate. He wasn't born in a palace, but he was born among the poor. And he walked among the poor and the needy. And that's our Jesus. God can do wonderful things with anyone's life. God is here every day working in lives of, as Mary said, lowly people, everyday common people. God doesn't call just the people who are on top. 
God calls everyone. When it was time for Jesus to be circumcised, Mary and Joseph brought their boy to the temple in Jerusalem. When King Herod the Great learned of a potential rival in Bethlehem, he ordered the execution of every young male child up to two years of age. Joseph has had a dream where an angel has told him that he needs to take off, so it's interesting. It's different than the angel appearing to Mary, uh, telling Mary that uh, Jesus is going to be born. It's uh, the angel coming to Joseph and offering some protection. And so they escape, just like any good parent. Joseph takes this seriously, takes this threat to his child, and they pack up the entire family. Doesn't say, but they leave immediately, whether that's the middle of the night or whatever. But they slip out the back door and go down to Egypt to find some safety, to find some protection for his kid. After Herod the Great dies, they head back up to home. Eventually, the family made their way back to Nazareth, and here, we believe, Jesus spent his childhood. Jesus' family made an annual pilgrimage here to Jerusalem for the Passover, the great Jewish festival, celebrating Moses leading the ancient Israelites out of Egyptian slavery. On the way home, Mary and Joseph discovered that their 12-year-old boy was missing from the family caravan. After three days, they found him in the temple, talking with the elders and holding his own against the biblical scholars of his day. How surprised they were after going to all the places where you might think a little boy might be to find him sitting with the elders in the midst of the company of the teachers and those who were the wise ones and the scribes and those who wrote down and talked and shared the story and tradition. To find him there must have amazed them. I don't think they were mad. I think his parents were surprised greatly. Why did you make us look for you, Jesus? Well, I don't have an answer for that. Why didn't you keep up with the family? Well, I wasn't thinking about the family. I was thinking about how wonderful it was to be with these elders and teachers and for them to care enough about me to invite me to stay with them. And I didn't think it was wrong. And I hope you don't think it was wrong because this was why I think you brought me here in the first place. Jesus began his public ministry around the age of 30 after being baptized by his cousin John in the Jordan River one who is commonly known to us as John the Baptist. John was born a uh, cousin to Jesus about the same time, raised most likely with him. But when his moment of ministry unfolded, they took two very different paths. John found himself in the desert of Judea in the wilderness. And as the scriptures say, he was living on honey and wild locusts. John is preaching about repentance, that the people need to change their ways, uh, repent from what it is they're doing and live a life of righteousness. They need to um, stop sinning, basically, and stop living immorally. And Jesus comes out there to get baptized as well. And according to one of the Gospels, we hear that there's a little bit of a conflict, that John recognizes Jesus and says, you should be the one doing this to me. Something happens in the heavens, they open up, that the Spirit descends like a dove, and a voice is heard, whether Jesus is the only one who hears that or whether the entire crowd hears that. But this is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Immediately after his baptism, Jesus was led into the wilderness by the devil. And there he was tested or tempted by Satan with some powerful offers to deny God. At one point, the devil tempted Jesus to turn a stone into a loaf of bread, to which Jesus replied, One cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. The humanity of Jesus comes through to us as we see, what does this mean? Well, it means 
well, he's going to have to discover what it means, and it's going to be very tempting to go choose some other path um, than what's laid before him. And if Jesus is both truly human and truly God, the truly human side has to be honestly tempted throughout all of those struggles. We're standing on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and it's from in and around this region that Jesus formed an inner circle of friends willing to follow him. We refer to these individuals as the 12 disciples. He was in Galilee to be a godly presence among people who were not considered to be kosher, or according to Hoyle, as, for being Jewish, but the people of Galilee and Samaria, even up that way, were far removed from the holy centers of Jerusalem and all that was going on down there. There was this a widening of the perspective of how God's love would go out to a wide variety of people in the world. The disciples were Galileans. They were called from Galilee. They spent a lot of their time up there in that region just being disciples and being with Jesus and doing ministry of sorts, listening to people, doing some healings. But that was the beginning of saying that the gospel is more than just for the people of Jerusalem. I see Peter as this big, burly, earthy person. I can see Peter out there just sweating and dirty and, and just all day. We've got to get this in. Forget this stuff, you know. And here comes Andrew. Peter, come see a man. I know you love him, you know, and Philip and all these guys running around. And uh, 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 Peter says, oh, I don't have time for this. We've got to get the, you know, and he comes and, and all of a sudden he's hit between the eyes. Jesus had a great sense of humor. He loved life and that drew people to him. Crying and frowning doesn't really draw a lot of people to you. But the laughing, one-on-one, -on -one, sharing those moments uh, that are strange and weird in life, I think Jesus did a lot of that, especially with if you look at the people he called, like, you know, the fishermen and, and the, and the, uh, the uh, uh, Levi, the uh, tax collector. And then the women. He called real women, not the pietistic ones, but women that really knew life and the hardships of life. One of the significant claims of the Christian faith is that Jesus Christ is both fully divine and fully human. Have this mind amongst yourself, which was in Christ Jesus, though he is in the form of God. He did not count equality a thing to be grasped, but here's the key, he emptied himself. And I think it's total emptiness. The reason why I say that is because if Jesus was truly going to understand you and I and this whole world and humanity, Jesus had to take from himself all that was God. I think that the story of Christ is one where divinity finds a way to be expressed in the exchanges that mark human community. The exchange of, of grieving, the exchange of, of hungry people being fed, the exchange that comes when we encounter an overwhelming dilemma, which we might call illness, which we might call brokenness. The miracles are to a diverse group of people, the women and blind and lame and lepers and to his own beloved you get a real feel that Jesus cares about all people no matter what. His mother comes to him and says, Jesus, we're going to a wedding. Now, here's a man in his 30s, probably, or somewhere around there. We don't know exactly. And his mother comes to him and says, we're going to a wedding. And if my mother would have come to me when I was 30 and said, Charles, we're going to this wedding, I would say, Mom, come on. I'm a man. I don't need it. And I see Jesus doing the same thing. Mom, it's not my time. They have no wine. And he knows his mother very well. And he knows that it's probably God speaking through her time for him to let go of his first miracle. He changes the water into wine. Can you imagine that 
purified wine being given to all of the people, all of the guests. And, and it was just like happiness. You've heard the line about a prophet being without honor in his own country. Well, it's a line and a story right out of St. Matthew's Gospel, the 13th chapter. Early in his public ministry, Jesus returned to his hometown of Nazareth, only to be rejected by his own people. When Jesus went back to his hometown, he basically wanted to share where he had allowed the Holy Spirit to take him. But upon arriving there, it was kind of interesting that they never uh, could see beyond what he used to be. The question that people begin to ask is, who does this guy think he is? This is Joseph's son. And the challenge, I think, is for us to be able to share with people that we're familiar with the fact that this is a life-changing, life-giving story of God's love in Christ, that there's really something that does change us. And to be willing to risk putting that out there in our relationships, in our work relationships, not as a way of converting people or proselytizing, but of letting people know that we take this so seriously that it's changed the way we choose to live. They knew Jesus only in this form of being the son of the carpenter, uh, Joseph. And basically, when Jesus came to them in a whole new beautiful expression, it didn't matter. The base camp for Jesus and his disciples was right here in and around Capernaum. Capernaum was a busy trading port and customs center in the first century. Several of the disciples, including Andrew and Peter, made their home in Capernaum beside the Sea of Galilee. The Gospels tell us that Jesus preached here in Capernaum's synagogue. Excavations show that the foundations of this synagogue date all the way back to the first century. For three very active years, Jesus and his disciples made their way around the whole region of Galilee, preaching, teaching, and healing sick people. Everybody wanted to see this young rabbi, this great, powerful teacher, and listen to his words and experience the miracles that they had seen. Uh, and heard of throughout the countryside. As he was going, a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, hemorrhaging, heard of Jesus and like everyone else, wanted to come to the great healer to experience a bit of that grace and miracle that she had heard about. When Jesus is in reach, she stretches her arm out and she touches the fringe of his cloak. He turns around and the first thing he asks his disciples is, who just touched me? Well, as they're looking at uh, this crowd around him, I believe it was Peter that looked at him and said, well, Master, wh what do you mean who touched you? Everyone wants to touch you. To which Jesus said, no, someone touched me. And it wasn't just someone, it was a person of faith. This woman stands up and says, it was me. I did it. When she did this, Jesus looked at her and didn't see an unclean woman. Jesus looked at her and didn't see a person who broke any kind of rituals or rabbinic laws. What Jesus saw was a person of faith. And it was at that point in time that he acknowledged it and actually lifted her up, not simply as a person who did an act, but as a valuable person who is worth touching. Jesus loved to tell stories for the sake of making a point about how the kingdom of God works. The Gospels refer to these stories as parables. I think parables are a way to, to help us to overhear a story. Sometimes it may even be a way for us to, to think that Jesus really isn't talking about me, he's talking about somebody else, but then we realize, oh, this may have something to do with me after all. We can place ourselves in the story uh, and we can understand the dynamic of, of what was happening there more than any other possible way that would be presented to us. Story is life. There's three stories of lost things, the lost son, the lost coin, and the lost sheep. And in each case, Jesus tells a story about someone who goes to great lengths to find the lost, to welcome the lost, to make sure that the thing that is lost, the person that's lost, 
when they're found that there's great joy and celebration about that. And being found in God, I think, is is knowing about God's grace, knowing about God's love, knowing about the forgiveness that's been given to us. The rich young ruler comes to him, he asks specifically, what is it that I need to do in order to get into heaven? He goes through a whole litany of things, and the rich young ruler kind of looks at him and goes, oh, that's great, and he took like a checklist, he takes them, and he checks them all off. And finally, he still wants to be absolutely certain that he's dotted his I's and crossed his T's. And then once uh, he believes that he's done it all, Jesus looks at him and says, well, no, actually, you really want to know what you have to do? You have to give it all up. Behind me on the hill in the distance is the Mount of Beatitudes. Christian pilgrims from all over the world come to this place where tradition tells us Jesus delivered his extended Sermon on the Mount. The Church of the Beatitudes was built in 1937 by brothers of the Franciscan Order. It was a huge gathering that day and a great occasion for preaching. Jesus covered a whole wide range of subjects from which we have important reminders that God will take care of our anxiousness for tomorrow, that our treasure's not in our wallets, but in heaven, and that we must find a way to love our enemies. We're in the Church of the Multiplication, just outside Capernaum. This is the site where a tradition tells us Jesus took five loaves and two fish and fed some 5,000 people, one of the great miracles of abundance in the New Testament. Crowd of people up on the bank, and uh, Jesus had been talking to them, speaking to them about what he saw for their lives, and then they kind of, disciples discovered that uh, it's getting uh, time to eat and what should happen. <laughs> so Jesus said to the disciples, well, let them sit down and it's going to be worked out. A young boy in the one gospel at least brought some fish that he had and bread forward. Soon they discovered that everybody was getting something to eat. They just were amazed as we are amazed at what happened there because uh, Jesus care for them and this uh, young boy with a vision to bring forward of uh, what he had. One of Jesus' most well-known teaching moments happened here on the Sea of Galilee. The Gospels tell different versions of the same story. In the point in time, he told the disciples to go across the sea and he would meet him on the other side. And the disciples, thinking this isn't a big deal, decide to get into the boat and they begin to proceed across the waters. As they go across the waters, something begins to happen. The waters begin to churn, the wind begins to howl, and they find themselves spinning and in fear that they're going to go down and that they're going to drown. As this begins to happen, they find that there's a person walking to them who they can't quite make out yet. Peter looks up, looks at this person and says, who are you? And initially they think it's a ghost. But Jesus says, it's me. Jesus reaches out to Peter and he says, come to me. Well, finally he finds the courage and he steps out and he begins to walk. And at the moment when he realizes that one, he's going to God, he also realizes he's standing on water. And then doubt begins to infuse him. Fear begins to be, uh, overtake him. And what happens to him? He begins to sink. But even in the moment when Peter begins to sink, what does Jesus do? Even in the moment when he finds himself failing, Jesus reaches down and he grabs him, and he pulls him up, and he holds him to him. An event called the Transfiguration began to enlarge the disciples' understanding of who Jesus is. It became clear to them that he's much more than a miracle worker or a teacher, much more than a moral man. Behind me in the fog is the Church of the Transfiguration atop Mount Tabor. From here you can see across the expansive region of Galilee, from Nazareth and Megiddo to Tiberias and the Sea of Galilee. Once Jesus was transfigured before his disciples atop the clouds on the mountain, 
a whole series of events began to make it increasingly clear that he was on his way to Jerusalem and his eventual death. Jesus goes to the top of a mountain and he's got his inner three, Peter, James, and John, who are there with him. And as they go up to the top, it's interesting, it starts as a prayer uh, experience that Jesus is there to pray. And while he's praying, something strange happens. Some guys show up who didn't walk up the hill with him. Moses and Elijah somehow appear on the scene. The clothes are glowing. The uh, lights are flashing. People who we have heard about that are the great legends are all of a sudden there. And they have a conversation that is for their ears only, apparently. It's certainly not for the readers of the gospel. But because of that conversation, we now have a deeper appreciation for what's going on in Jesus' head, in his mind, in his imagination, in his dreams, in his thoughts. Jesus is talking to Moses and Elijah. He's talking about his departure, I think is what most of the translations say. Uh, if you look at it, it's probably the same word that gets used. Uh, Jesus is impending exodus that was about to take place in Jerusalem. We see uh, Peter always trying to insert himself. And, 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 and like we, all of us humans, you know, he's standing on a mountaintop with his, you know, his two other guys, James and, uh, James and John, and uh, all of a sudden this phenomenal thing takes place. And he says, well, let, let's do something. And Jesus said, just... Take it easy. It tells us that there's some confusion that Peter maybe doesn't get it, even though he's the one who's experiencing this, that he doesn't even know what to say about what it is that just has been experienced. He comes up with a bright idea to build some tents or to build some dwellings for them to stay there. And of course, we hear that voice that comes from heaven again. We get that same refrain, you know, this is my son, the beloved or the chosen one. Uh, listen to him, that we hear that same refrain that got used in his baptism that something similar is happening here, that Jesus is getting a chance to relook at his ministry, relook at his activity in the world, that he gets two of the best counselors that have ever showed up on the scene, that Moses and Elijah, those two guys who had a special relationship with God, are the ones who are going to offer that counsel, give him that guidance, give him that wisdom. Luke says that um, a woman who had sinned came into the house where Simon the leper was. She took this alabaster jar and she didn't pour it over his head. She anointed his feet. And along with that was the tears. Her tears fell on Jesus' feet along with the oil and she wiped his feet with her hair. And she was a sinner. I mean, that's pretty powerful. She's preparing him for his burial. Things were coming to a head now. Luke tells us that the Pharisees warned Jesus to flee. King Herod wanted him dead, but undeterred by everything except for an obedience to the Father. Jesus was determined to head to Jerusalem to celebrate the great Jewish festival, the Passover. On the way into town, crowds gave Jesus a hero's welcome, shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The whole city was in turmoil. Those unfamiliar with Jesus were told, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Tensions rose in a series of confrontations with the authorities. Upon arriving in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and overturned the money changers' tables. He said, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The Roman authorities had no interest in Jesus and even less in the Jewish religion. Rome wanted its own civil order and a stop to any troublemakers who threatened its idea of empire. During the Passover, the disciples prepared the festive meal. And while they were eating, Jesus stunned the group by saying, one of you will betray me. 
Whether it was the lure of money and financial gain, or something else altogether, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, secretly went to the authorities and offered to betray Jesus. Jesus, in his final words, uh, before he's uh, betrayed and, and made to go to trial, he says to those closest to him, you are no longer considered servants, but now friends. I call you my friends. And the reason I can call you friends is because I'm sharing with you everything that the Father is telling me. Then Jesus took some bread and some wine, and he gave each to the disciples. He said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the wine, gave it to them, and said, Drink, this is my blood, which is poured out for all people for the forgiveness of sin. After they ate, Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem, crossed the nearby Kidron Valley, and settled in an olive grove called the Garden of Gethsemane. As Jesus prayed, he asked of his disciples to stay awake and keep watch. Jesus threw himself upon the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. These poor disciples, you know, they've been awake for however long. Once again, they're just too tired to do exactly what Jesus says. So they fall asleep. Jesus comes back, finds them sleeping, and says, Couldn't you stay awake for just a little longer? Judas comes up and gives him that fateful kiss that identifies him to the Roman guards and authorities. People are rushed away, and pretty soon they end up in front of the Jewish Sanhedrin the collection of Jewish officials of the day. Jesus is on trial there, but of course they too have trouble finding anyone who will speak against him because nobody's seen him do anything truly against God and against scripture. So they get frustrated knowing that he just is so much of a threat. They send him then to the Roman authorities who at that point in time are purely interested in civil order and they say, fine. If you want us to handle it, we will. They Then Pontius Pilate interviews Jesus. Don't you have anything to say for yourself, he says. Pontius Pilate does try to release Jesus. He doesn't want to be the one to say, you have to die. So he goes before the crowd of people who were probably expecting someone to be released. That was their tradition on Passover. And he says, how about if I release this Jesus to you? you? You really liked him when he came into town about a week ago. But they instead say, no, we want Barabbas, the convicted killer that was alongside Jesus that day. So Barabbas is released and Jesus is handed over to be crucified. I'm sure that Mary was walking, following, running, trying to get in there where her son was crying, weeping. This narrow walkway within the walls of Jerusalem is part of what is known as the Via Dolorosa, or the Way of Sorrows. For centuries, Christian pilgrims from around the world have walked in the footsteps of Jesus, following him to the place where he was crucified. In 1992, my back was broken, my pelvis was dislocated, it was separated about nine inches. I was torn all the way up into the abdomen, my legs were torn, I was in a lot of pain. And as I laid on the bed, uh, in the ICU for 28 days, I realized that this is really painful, but what Christ went through was so much greater than my physical pain. He took on my sins, and, and you don't know me, I know me, and I know that my sin, even one day of sin, could crush any human being. He not only took mine, he took the entire world's, didn't even ask permission, just did it because he loved me. Mary in the Passion story appears at the cross, her faithfulness as mother. I can't imagine the pain of watching your own child crucified, which she is doing. And of course the women are willing to stick around and watch. The men go into hiding, but the women are there and they're the ones who will see that the body is taken care of when it comes off the cross.
when the lifeless body of Jesus was taken down from the cross, it was laid in a tomb. What happens next in the resurrection forms the central message of Christianity. This Church of the Holy Sepulchre marks the burial place of Jesus. Jesus has died. He's been taken down. And Mary Magdalene goes to see him. As Mary Magdalene goes to see Jesus, she gets there and she realizes that the tomb is empty. John's Gospel tells us that when Mary was in the garden near the tomb, she turned around and saw Jesus but did not recognize him. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have taken away my Lord, tell me where you have laid him. Jesus looked at her and simply said, Mary. When Mary Magdalene sees him and begins to rejoice, what you see is the moment in which life can never be the same. What you see is the moment in which Mary Magdalene, who many people consider to have been a fallen person for a variety of reasons, no longer has to worry about her indiscretions of the past. But because of a Lord who has come back to her, because of the resurrection, because of the understanding that death is uh, no longer something that can claim us, what it also affirms for every person who sees this is that the life that Jesus brings into the world as he is once again alive is a life that allows us as his followers, even the imperfect ones like Peter, the ones like Mary Magdalene, what it bring, means to us is that even as we try to walk that faith journey, every time we stumble because of his resurrection, because of his life, we may always find our, a path back to God. I'm most intrigued by the fact that the first witnesses to the resurrection were women. And the fact that the women were the first ones trusted with this message and that they went back and tried to tell the disciples and it was received as an idle tale. Um, I think there's some of that that's still going on. There are plenty of people in the world that don't believe that the resurrection happened or don't think it has any relevance. And yet we're still called to go and tell the tale. There's lots of condemnation and uh, non-acceptance out there. But I think that the resurrection says, hey, we're all in this new life together. Christ has been, been killed, crucified, but he's been raised. And through baptism, he lives in us. And I think that we better go out there and really promote that new life, that resurrection that was so important. That's what turned the early church on, uh, was the resurrection. I think the uh, passion story is so central um, it was because it puts the cross at the center of where we are. Uh, the resurrection comes through the cross. Uh, we're Lutherans. We look at the cross. We, that's uh, where our theology kind of gets centered. And God's love for us is revealed in this most cruel and horrible death of the innocent one, uh, a death that, that, we, that we inflicted upon him. And God says, I will love you through this. Uh, and God doesn't go around that. All four Gospels tell of Jesus appearing to people after his resurrection. The story of his encounter with Thomas, the disciple, is among the most well-known. One poor disciple wasn't there at the beginning. When the rest of the disciples were in the room and Jesus first appears, to the collection of his followers and says, I have come back. So Thomas doesn't believe it. I'm not gonna believe that he's come back from the dead unless I can put my fingers in his wounds and touch the wounds on his side. That's exactly what Jesus does. He comes back, he tells him, hey, I have risen from the dead. Go ahead, put your hand in my side. Thomas does that, my savior and my God. He's just filled with that sense of, okay, now I've done this. And of course, Jesus has to apply it all to us right away and say, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. After the resurrection, Jesus ascended into heaven 40 days later. But before ascending, he told the disciples to spread the good news to all the ends of the earth. And he also told them that the power of the Holy Spirit would be with them, and that yes, he would return again. We can't just wait for Jesus to come back. We can't think we know when that's gonna happen. If I knew the earth was gonna to end tomorrow, what would you do? Plant a tree. 
I think that's what we're meant to do. We're not supposed to just um, anticipate that Jesus coming back is the only thing we have to do with Christians. It's what we do while we wait that matters. Jesus had to understand us. He had to understand our joys, our sorrows, our pains, all those things. Why do you want to belong to a God who doesn't really know it, who knows, oh, I'm going to rise on the third day, so you know what, no big deal, I'll just do it. That isn't God. That isn't what we see in the Old Testament. That's not what we see in the New Testament. We see a God who truly was 100% human while being 100% God. He's my Lord and Savior. He's the one that gave his life that I would be forgiven and renewed. He's everything about any possible thing I could know about life now and life as it's going to be unfolded in whatever future there's going to be. And there'll be a future because I'll die like every other human being. And what I know is at that, at, at that point of death, I'll be asleep in Jesus. And wow, what a wondrous sense of grace and peace. I don't think that Jesus is like a hard drive where you hit enter and it all comes out. I think it's more like a symphony that you kind of get. It's like a jazz concert where you kind of want to wish that solo could be played again. But because it's jazz, you'll never hear it the same way again. But that's okay because you can go see the artist again. God is saying, boldly, dramatically through becoming one of us, that I love you, I care for you, I am one of you, I am with you, and I ought to condemn you or to cast you out. I'm here to give you love and care and grace and all the forgiveness you need to live in this world. There are so many things in life that happen every day that prove that God continues to be active. God wants to be so present with us that God sent his son to be a part of our lives in a very real way. So it's very common sense for me to think that God would send his son to be with us. And then those stories would come down to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.